around it. I'm going to start with a rhetorical question. Um, sometimes when uh, I start with rhetorical questions, people want to sort of jump into the answer. Um, please do not on this particular occasion, okay? I know that most of you are either of or heading towards more mature years. <laughs> Aren't we, Walter? Yeah. Um, I'm already there. But I, 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 think, I think most of us still have our, our, our memories intact. And so here's, here's the question for you. Um, do you remember a time in your life when you were absolutely crazy in love with somebody? I, you say, all that I said before about him being rhetorical and all the rest of it is, is because of Walter. Because I knew as soon as I said that he would juggle. Um, but that, that, that's, that's what I'm going to do. Just, just think back for a while. At some point in your life when you were crazy in love. Um, maybe there's been a lot of times in your life when you were crazy in love. Um, I don't know, I think back to Jody Einbinder. Strange name, huh? Jody Einbinder. I met Jody Einbinder from Wayne, New Jersey when I was 14. And uh, she was a clarinet player in the concert band from her high school. And I was a tuba player from Montreal. Now, isn't that romance right there? The clarinet player and the tuba player. Like, how could they not come together? Um, and uh, we did a band exchange. And Jody Einbinder was the first girl I kissed. True confessions. And I don't even know if I already turned the video on because I didn't see her do it. Um, so if Jody Einbinder sees this on YouTube, she'll go, oh, not him. Uh, in fact, uh, later, she wouldn't remember me. Um, in fact, I wouldn't have heard them. Uh, in fact, later in the summer, we exchanged letters, you know, and um, in one of the letters, which was a lovely letter, you know, telling me how our weeks were going and what the school was like and heading towards summer and da 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 da. She said, um, have you learned how to kiss yet? You know, and I'm, oh, you know. But Jody Einbinder was, you don't have to laugh that much, I still see you trembling. Uh, come on, I was only 14. I, that I told you a lot more than I was intending to. Uh, but I, I remember Jody Einbinder, you know. Uh, and sometimes every now and then I, 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 I think, I wonder what she's doing now. Mary is, what's, what's, what's her name like? Uh, remember when you were crazy in love? Uh, it's, it's this weird, non-rational thing. Um, and do you remember? Or maybe it wasn't like this for you. But do you remember that there was no system in anything to do with your body or your brain that worked properly? You know, um, it was like all the coordinates and how to get to the coordinates were scrambled. Um, nothing made sense anymore. Uh, you would find yourself at work, trying to concentrate on work, and you would discover that you just sort of drifted for about 10 minutes. Um, you would just find yourself at the strangest times, uh, thinking of the person you were crazy in love with. Uh, something was going on in your body that was weird, you know, and we could say like the electrical impulses somehow got snafued or, um, or, or, or there's you know, having trouble with your digestion or, or whatever, but something had happened to you that just changed everything and it had a physical, uh, a physical response, an emotional response, there was not one part of your being uh, that was left, uh, that was left unaffected. Uh, and it was, it, it, it's crazy. It, it really, it makes no sense. Um, because you end up doing things that you look back years later and you sort of go, that was so dumb. Uh, or, or maybe you don't. You know, maybe you're, you're one of the blessed or lucky ones, depending on what term you prefer, uh, who looks back and says, that was the best time of my life and it still is the best time of my life. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're still there. I start like this today. Because when I began my sermon during Lent, I said that what I really want people to take away from the Lenten sermons, uh, as we gear up for Easter and particularly on Easter, uh, is to realize and to remember that God is crazy in love with you. And he really is. Uh, all God thinks about is you. 
Well, he thinks about his planet too, and how he stewards of it, and you know, all the animals and you know, the trees and grass and all that too. But you're never out of God's mind. Isn't that amazing? And when you consider it, talk about a heart drink, you know, uh, you're never out of God's mind. Uh, you are always on his mind. And when you choose to converse with him, we call it prayer. And when you choose to converse with him, um, he's delighted that you're there having a conversation with him. And when you think of that, it's really rather remarkable. I, I, I can't understand it, you know, I can't really process it. I don't have what it takes, um, but, it, but it's there. Um, I, I, I once met a man, he was just, just an amazing, amazing guy. Um, well, I've, I've referred to him in the past, Archbishop Yehuda Um Just an amazing man, former Archbishop in Uganda. And I, I didn't know him well, I only met him once. He was the type of person, you walk into his presence, and when he's having a conversation with you, it is like you are the only person in the world who exists. Uh, you have his 100% complete attention. He is completely engaged. He is not thinking about his next meeting or that he has to go pee or what's for supper. You know, he is right there with you, totally, totally, completely engaged. And that's the way God is when we come to him. Of course, we have to come to him to know that, but that's another thing. Uh, but that's the way God is. You're never off of his mind, you're never out of his mind. Uh, he is never inattentive to you and, and your needs and your prayers. Uh, there is not a moment in your life where he isn't sharing in your joys and sharing as well in your sorrows. Uh, there is nowhere, nowhere you can go to get away from that. Uh, you cannot change his nature. Uh, you cannot say, God, take a break, you deserve a holiday. Uh, he is there, he is on 100% of the time, and he's on your side 100% of the time. Uh, and he loves you with a spiritual love, really, uh, but a physical love as well. Uh, a love that is manifested in some of the most real, gritty uh, ways that we human beings experience love. And the gospel story today with Richard Ray, uh, is, is, is one such encounter between God uh, and one human being. And like when you think of it, God takes on human flesh in the form of Jesus. And yes, there are many accounts in the gospels of Jesus interacting with groups of folks. Um, but I think if we were all to just sort of let our brains flash on the stories we remember the most, I think for most of us it would probably be this individual encounter with, with people, um, the one-on-ones that Jesus has. And today is a rather spectacular one, uh, for several reasons. One, of course, for what actually happens in the Gospel, the actual mechanics of it, uh, and another for what it means about the nature of God, the nature of humanity, and the nature of our relationship together, because it is a relationship together. So at the risk of being just, I hope, only a little bit tedious, uh, uh, I want to just sort of revisit the, uh, the gospel story. It's a story, we all know it, you, you learn it in Sunday school, uh, the man born blind, blind from birth. And uh, he comes to Jesus, and the words can be any words, uh, but it is communicated to Jesus that he's got a problem and hanging up me. Uh, Jesus, what, what, what do you want me to do? I want to see. I want to see again. And so there's this interaction. And obviously right at the beginning, and I've said this so many times, and it's worth saying again and again, um, Jesus shows his, his, the respect that he has for our humanity in not presuming to know what we want unless and until we express it. It's kind of obvious the guy's lying. But Jesus doesn't presume on him in any way. I want to see. And so Jesus does something that's very odd. Uh, we can get into the symbolism of it another time if you want. But he reaches down and gets some, some, some dust or some dirt, some clay. No, it wouldn't be clay. Uh, spits, makes it with spit. And uh, uh, makes a paste out of it. And then he rubs it on the man's eyes. Now what an odd thing to do. 
um, there are times where people were healed and Jesus didn't say a word, didn't even touch them. I remember the story of a woman who had a hemorrhage for over a decade and uh, she touched him. He felt power go out of him. He felt that somebody was touching him with intentionality. Uh, he recognized that. But he didn't really do anything. Uh, he didn't wave his hands or you know, throw magic potions or anything like that. Um, there are times where he just says a word. And the word, obviously, is a word of power in that particular circumstance. Like, kind of like who. Um, there are times where he does other things. But on this particular occasion, for a particular reason, he makes a paste out of mud and puts it on the guy's eyes. And then he says something really interesting. He says, now go and wash in the pool of Siloam. He doesn't just say go and wash your eyes and you'll be fine. He doesn't say go in the Jordan River. Uh, he says go and wash your eyes in the pool of Siloam. Does that mean, and this is not the rhetorical part, this is the please answer back part. Does that mean any bells for anybody in the pool of Siloam? Don't be shy. There's another story about a pool. Another story about a pool. There was a pool, and um, depending on how you, that's right, yeah. Uh, depending on how you read the story, um, it, it, it could be read in many different ways. The pool of Siloam uh, was a naturally occurring water source, and in the days of Jesus, in, in fact, in the Middle East today, to some degree, wherever there's water, you're going to have civilization. Like villages and towns are going to grow up around where, where water is. It's, it's, it's such a precious and necessary life. And depending on the rainy season and the way things work, uh, some of these water sources or wells or pools, uh, they go up and they go down, right? Uh, because when the rain falls, it'll go through, and I'm not a geologist, but it'll go through, and then it'll fill the underwater aquifers and da 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 da. Uh, well, there was this pool. The one they believed was that every now, well, every now and then, uh, at an unpredictable time, the waters would rise in the pool and they would swirl around. And over time, the tradition had arisen that if you hung around the pool and were there when the water started to swirl and you were the first person to jump in, any illness you had would be good. Okay? Do you remember the story of a paralytic who was hanging out by the pool, hoping to be the first in when the water swirl, but because he was a paralytic, he never could be. So it was healing in another way. Okay, that's the same pool. So what's going on here is Jesus sends this man to that pool that is known, quote unquote, known to have mystical property or some power to heal. But he sends the man to wash, not when the waters are swirling. He doesn't say, go hang out with mud on your eyes until the waters are swirling. He just tells him to go and wash. So what is being demonstrated here? That his power is greater than any of the powers of the legends or myths or histories or superstitions that the people held in those days. That Jesus could heal using just ordinary water. You don't need any magic. You don't need any hocus pocus. You don't need special chemicals. Uh, you don't need the right incantations. What you need is a relationship with Jesus. That's what you need. And so the man goes to the pool, apparently, uh, washes his eyes, and then in that day, what you did if you experienced what you believed to be healing, you had to go and show yourself to the priest and have a healing battle with and so the next verse in the song is, he goes and shows, shows himself to the priests. And there's some debate going on. And it's a lively, albeit logical debate. Um, this can't be the man. Like, we've known him. He, he's blind. This guy is, no, this can't be the one who was blind since birth. And so there's this big discussion on who is this? And in fact, religious people, uh, they want to clarify this. So they send for his parents. And, uh, the parents are asked, like, is this your son? You know, and uh, they, they say what well, they know. They say, 
yes, we know that he was blind from birth, uh, we know that he is our son, and uh, we know that now he can see. How come? We don't know. There's a lot we don't know, but this we know. He was blind, he's our son, and now we can see. And uh, then they go on, and it's really interesting what happens. I'd like to think, and I bet all of you would like to think, that if somebody came to this church um, with uh, a very serious uh, impairment, where they want to go blind, or where they want to go, oh, maybe multiple sclerosis, that if one day the blind person came to St. Mary's and could see, or one day uh, I came in walking like a normal person again, that you wouldn't say something nasty, but rather you'd be happy. You'd be happy, and you'd, you'd, you'd celebrate. But that's not what goes on here. Uh, the religious people get all incensed by this. And they say, you were steeped in sin from birth. And look what happens. They're challenged to change their thinking. They're challenged to acknowledge something. And they'd rather hang on to their traditions than be challenged, even though the thing that's challenging is something beautiful. Got blind from birth who can, who can see now. You were steeped in sin from birth. Yeah. Well, of course, you know what that goes back to. That goes back to the belief that if you are healthy, prosperous, successful, God is blessing you. If you were poor, um, had all sorts of problems, if you were sick, God cursed you. So in their theological understanding, the fact that this person was blind meant that either he or his parents, or their parents, or their parents, under the third and fourth generation, right, were sinners. And that this was a sign of God's disfavor. So let's put those pieces together. So if you've got Jesus saying, go and wash your eyes. He washes his eyes, he sees, goes to give testimony to this to the religious people. He obviously can see. First, they try to deny that it's the man who blind in the first place. When they can't deny that anymore, they resort to their tradition. You were steeped in sin. And then it goes on from there. They put him on the hot seat. They try to trap him. Because their real problem is with a Lord who is sovereign even over human frailty. They don't want to acknowledge that. They would rather hang on to their traditions. So here's a question for us. Are there times and places in our lives where we would rather hang on to what we know? What we know. Even if it isn't spectacular. But it's what we know. It may not be great, but at least I know it. Then acknowledge that God is crazy and love you and the part of what he wants us to heal you. Whether it's your body, your soul, your emotions. Because that's what's coming on here. This person who was who Jesus healed was going to have to come face to face with who it is and what it is that has happened to him. So there's this theological dance about sin. Sinner from birth, and when they eventually did have to acknowledge that the healing was legitimate, then what did they do? They tried to, to trash Jesus, right? Who is this guy? Well, I think he's a prophet. He's a sinner too. And so, since it's Jesus that has been given the credit for the healing, and they don't want to change their minds about what's gone on, they don't want to change their minds, the only thing they can do is trash Jesus. Crash talk. And isn't that what we do? when we're uncomfortable with something, when something rocks our boat, uh, something challenges us to be different or more than we are. i got to tell you, and I wonder whether I should put this into the sermon, but I, but I will. Um, there have been times in my life as a minister, uh, and like, I'm not making, like this is not a funny part of the sermon, uh, and I'm not equating myself in, with the story, but where within an average, ordinary parish church, 
people haven't liked the direction it's going in or wouldn't have chosen it for themselves or it isn't their own personal preference. And when they realize the church is going in that particular direction, um, and perhaps even that many, many others like it, um, the thing they resort to is trash and minister. Because um, there's nothing else to do. You can't reject what's going on, but you can't, but they don't reject what's going on. So it's the minister who gets rejected. Um, some of the letters that I've got, uh, the one who can publish the memoirs, uh, people can do that. If they don't like what they're hearing, don't like what they're seeing, feel challenged by it, or confronted by it, um, can say a whole lot of really angry stuff, but it's a reflection of them, not what's going on. And so what the Pharisees had to say about Jesus is not a reflection of Jesus. Uh, it's a reflection of where they're at. They would rather hold on to what they know than allow that something really special has gone on here and acknowledge it. Because you know what happens when you change your mind. Uh, God changes your heart. That's what goes on. You change your mind, you'll change your heart. And that can sound like a scary thing. Um, or it can just sound like something that you don't want or you feel you don't need. But what happened to that man when he came to Jesus? He was asked a question about Messiah. And then Jesus said to him, you know, the one who is to you, not the Messiah. And then that man, born blind, worshipped. Know the spiritual progression in him. When he was asked by the Pharisees, who did this? Who is this guy, Jesus? I think he's a prophet. So in a short space of time, he moved from, I think this guy's a prophet, to my Lord, to worship him, to acknowledge who he is. And what's the motivator in all this? The motivator is not his condition. Uh, the motivator is not the fact that he's blind. What motivates this whole story is God's love for his creation. God's love for this one man expressed through Jesus doing something really, really ordinary. And I don't know, I don't know how to communicate how big God's love is for us. I, I, I just don't. I don't know how as a human being to step into uh, a person's woundedness. Um, and we're all, like, we're all wounded in various ways. Um, I don't know how to step into a person's fear. And fear comes out in so many weird ways. Eh? I don't know how to step into a person's fear. I don't know how to step into a person's sadness with enough words or the right words to say, it doesn't have to be like that. It could be different. But what I can do is tell the story. I don't know how to talk about God's love in such a way that just the, 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 just the words uh, speak so powerfully that it's life transforming. I don't know how to do that. Um, but I can say that God is crazy in love with you. Uh, I don't know what else to say. Uh, and I can say that when I, when I think back in, in, in my life, uh, of people who have loved me and people who do love me now, I can see a taste, a, a, a shadow, not a, not a bad shadow, but a shadow of, of the love that God has for me. Because in every bit of love I give and every bit of love I receive, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of the Spirit of God sort of stirring the waters up. It's a metaphor, stirring the waters up. But there's absolutely no way that any human being could possibly love me or love you with the degree of love that God loves me. And when you love, well, what happens when you love? Uh, creation happens. <laughs> you know? Being a very convenient to our baby this morning, that's great. Uh, babies, you know, sign of human love. You know? Uh, art. Art. Maybe I should use the word 
passion there instead of love. But there's 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 love in there in art. Um, I've been to some to see some lovely gardens. People put just incredible amounts of energy, care. Uh, I've seen relationships. Uh, I've seen people in their eighties walking together, holding hands. God, that's a glorious thing to see. I've, I've, I've seen enough, I've had enough of a taste that I could go, wow, that is, that is glorious, but it is only pale shadow of God's love for me. That's all I can do. All I can do is tell the story, tell that story, and, and, and hopefully encourage people to get to the point of saying, I know what it's like to be in love. I know what it's like. Maybe you won't to go so far as to say crazy in love, because that's a little nuts, right? No one wants to be nuts. But I know what being in love is like. And if that's what God feels towards me, if that's what God has for me, I'm because I know that love creates, love heals, Love grows, love restores, and it's just glorious. So, all of us, in one way or another, in many ways, come into the world broken. Uh, sometimes the brokenness is a physical thing, or a uh, Sometimes it's something that happens to us in our lives. Uh, certainly. All of us get damaged, get broken emotionally. Uh, you can't live on this planet too long without experiencing that. Uh, we get hurt, and the hurt holds. Uh, and spiritually, spiritually. Uh, if we were spiritually where we would want to be and God wants us to be, uh, it would be like walking arm in arm with God in the garden every moment of our lives. But it's not like that. Uh, because spiritually, we're open as well. But God doesn't abandon us. He doesn't leave us to our own devices. He doesn't say, by the way, self-help program. Those are the wrong self-help programs. Um, he wants to come into our life and have a face-to-face -face encounter and make us see again. Or make us walk again. Or give us the ability to love again. Because that can get on that in my life as well. He wants all these things for us because he's crazy in love with us. And the other thing about crazy in love, uh, you make everybody around you sick when you're crazy in love. But it's lovely. It's lovely. You also make them smile in their soul. Uh, when you're with people who are in love, your stomach tingles too, you know, and your soul gets tickled as well, because it's beautiful, because it's what we're waiting for. So, just to summarize it all, all of us have wounds, have damage. God doesn't want us to just get used to it. God, God doesn't want us to just make the best of it. God wants to heal us. Whatever the mud is that he wants to wipe on your eyes or whatever, uh, or whatever it is he wants to reach in and, and, and be warm with his touch. Whatever he wants to do, he wants to do because he's crazy in love with you. And so for all of us, may our spiritual journey in this Lent and into the glory of the resurrection of Easter, based on the recognition that part of what we're here for is to grow more and more into a knowledge of, but please, even more particularly, an experience of that God is crazy in love with you. And he wants you to know it, experience it, and live it. Now let's pray. Amen. God, sometimes in our lives it's easier to identify with a man um, before he gets his son back, uh, rather than after when he's healed. Stuff that really hurts and still hurts. And maybe even especially the stuff that 
we don't feel the hurt, but it's still there, there. So like that man, we come into your presence today, having acknowledged you as God's son, and having acknowledged that you do love us, and ask you to heal us, whatever wounds there are, be they emotional or physical uh, or spiritual, the stuff that life has done to us. Come into our lives and heal us and restore us. Probably bit by bit, we feel most comfortable in the state that you would like us to be in. And we pray for people that we know who uh, are also suffering. People who, uh, because of their past, uh, find it hard to love. People who have uh, put up some pretty strong concrete walls. Pray for people who feel the experience of rejection, sometimes from a really young age, and just don't know how to handle it. God, as well as all this, please restore in us the memory or the experience of what it's like to be in love again. And please let that form our lives and the lives of those whom we touch. In Jesus' name.